clarify something from um, just the terminology you use? When you talk about the view of IMF staff, mm -hmm. and you say things like IMF staff when, it, when you're talking about imposing uh, burden sharing, are you talking about the view of the IMF representatives here on the ground, or the view of the organisation, or is there a, a difference? Uh, uh, there, there can be a difference. Okay. Uh, uh, as I said, uh, you know, uh, very early on in today's session, uh, it, when I talked about the uh, the, uh, the IMF's modus operandi, when we take a certain position, that's usually cleared by top management. Uh, uh, you know, so so we we typically, when we take a position, we have the blessings of top management. So uh, uh, I I, th I think uh, on. On burden sharing, uh, those were those were cleared positions. But they were the view of the IMF. That those, are, those are the, okay. the view. I wouldn't say that they were necessarily the views of the IMF board. I think again, you, you've got many layers. You've got the IMF staff. Mm -hmm. You've got the IMF management. By management, what we mean here is the managing director primarily, who's the head of the staff. And then you've got the executive board, which has representatives from uh, uh, the membership, the 24 executive directors. And I would not say that the IMF board was was fully behind uh, uh, the management and the staff on burden sharing. And you will see this in the context of the summing up of the ex post assessment that was done by the IMF on Ireland. The ex post assessment took a position on burden sharing very similar to what I've been saying. But if you look at the summing up of the executive board, that is much more lukewarm. Okay. But it's fair to say that the management had a view in favour of burden sharing. Uh, the IMF staff would not have been in a position to take the view, positions that it did if it did not have the support of IMF management. Okay. Um, you say in your opening statement that you provided Ireland with a specialist lawyer to advise on burden sharing. When, when was this? As, as uh, 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 Mr. Reardon said in his in his uh, statement in his uh, evidence to this committee, uh, this was in uh, November 2010. Yeah. And how long did they remain? It, uh, I, 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 it was not long. It was just a matter of days. Uh, a matter of days. It wasn't through till no. March 2011. Okay. No. Thank you. Um, you also say in the opening statement about the memorandum of understanding and how it intentionally leaves open the possibility for burden sharing. Yes. Did you communicate this to Fine Gael and Labour um, around the time of the agreement of the, the programme? I, I, specifically, I cannot remember, and, and, and even if I did remember, I think that then gets into, into uh, deliberations between us and the authorities. And okay. and but can you confirm that you were meeting with opposition parties around the time of the agreement of the programme? Oh, absolutely, okay. yes. That's very much in the public domain. Uh, we met with uh, the Labour Party. We met with uh, representatives of Sinn Féin. Uh, we uh, 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 and we rep met with uh, representatives uh, of, uh, of Fine Gael as well. But can you comment on whether or not you advised as to the possibility of burden sharing at a later date uh, after an election? For I'm, I'm not in a position to, to say anything. On that. Um, did you speak to uh, after the actual election? Mm -hmm. um, it's been reported that you uh, met with advisers from Fine Gael and Labour before an actual coalition government was, was agreed and formed. You know, I, I met with advisors from both those parties uh, many times. Uh, you know, uh, starting in November, uh, we may then have also had uh, uh, you know some contacts either on the phone or uh, uh, you know so so uh, uh, they, you know th this was a part of normal practice. But you don't recall specifically seeking to brief uh, Fine Gael and Labour advisers after the election and before the government was formed. Uh, I cannot agenda remember. Deputy Murphy, it may just clarify that a little bit. Yeah. It, would an agenda with regard to those parties being in government, going into government, if you maybe give some context to that? Yes, yeah, sorry. So, I mean, just to clarify, many it, meetings. it has been written that um, after the election, um, but prior to an actual coalition government being arranged, that you, on behalf of the IMF, sought you know, out the coalition advisors uh, on again, financial and economic issues to, to, to brief them, and it's also been characterised that the IMF was, that was a third partner, or the Troika was a third partner in those negotiations. Uh, and, and no, I think that is that it, to, to say that the the, the, the uh, external partners were a third partner in the negotiation between coalition partners would, would be absolutely false. They, they, we would never do that. But I think it is fair to say, and you know, this is not just for, in the case of Ireland. This is uh, you know, after an election when a new government is being formed. 
when a program is already in place, it is incumbent on the IMF and its partners as creditors to understand what the platform and policy position of an incoming government might be, because then we need to start thinking about do we need to modify this program? Where might we need to modify it? And you know, it's best to have the information to, to understand what uh, a new government might be thinking. So, so having discussions of that nature, not just in the case of Ireland, but in other countries as well, would be a part of the normal, normal modus operandi. But again, without interfering in the political process. The issue here is understanding what position, what the platform of an incoming government might be. So quite soon after the new government was formed, um, the government thinking, government understanding on burden sharing was that it was going to attempt it again at the end of March 2011. So what was the IMF position at the time? Again, in my, in my written statement, I talk about uh, what, uh, what we understood to be the new government's position as it was uh, preparing to announce the results of the uh, asset quality review and the stress tests at the end of March, which was a program requirement. Uh, and in that context, uh, the new government was thinking about making a distinction between what it called the pillar banks and then Anglo and INBS. We thought that that made a great deal of sense. Okay, so you were in agreement with that distinction and then what, that, yes. what, what followed from that in terms of burden sharing? Uh, uh, yes. Okay. And then just to clarify uh, two other things from your opening statement. Um, one is in relation to the, the spillover risks, which the I'll quickly, deputy. Thank you, Chair. Which the ECB feared, mm -hmm. and you say that they were exaggerated. Mm -hmm. um, if you could comment just a, a little bit more on that, just so we can understand that, because it's quite important in understanding yes. why we didn't pursue burden sharing, but also as well, um, you, you do give a figure in your opening statement of 16 billion around November 2010. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. did the IMF make calculations prior to that period in time, and, and what would that figure have been? Uh, okay, uh, let me answer the first part of your question. I think, you know, uh, the, the best description of our thinking about contagion risks and how they might be handled uh, was in the quote that I provided in my written statement. I quoted from uh, a, a semi-independent ex post evaluation of the program done by the IMF staff where the basic point that they made was that uh, 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 Irish senior unsecured bank bonds traded at levels con consistent with, a, with clear anticipations of a principal cut, re reflecting that some burden sharing was anticipated, and that also went on to discuss uh, other mitigating mechanisms if there did end up being some, some spillover. So, so I think I would draw your attention to that uh, uh, rather than reading it out again. Uh, uh, on uh, on the amounts, um, you know, uh, uh, look, people at the IMF, we're all number crunchers. We do this all the time. So, you know, if you're asking, had we been trying to crunch the numbers on these things earlier, uh, you know, that would that would be a part of our job. And is there a figure, a figure for that? Okay.